Hello viewers, I'm your host Chandrakala Chaudhary with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show with Pakistan which was slammed for its increasingly complicit role in the growing Islamic radicalization on the sidelines of the ongoing 37th session of United Nations Human Rights Council in Geneva by eminent intellectuals. Participants not only condemned it for providing safe haven to the terrorists perpetrating terror across South Asia and globe, but call it a terror factory that has become a threat to itself. A report. Researchers, scholars and human rights activists from across the globe came under one roof to participate in an event titled Growing Extremism in South Asia – Repercussions for the West, held on the sidelines of the 37th session of UN Human Rights Council in Geneva. Organized by the Brussels-based European Foundation for South Asian Studies, the event focused at the rising Islamic terrorism in South Asia. Speaker expressed their views as the originator and perpetrator of religion-based extremism, Pakistan that has been working relentlessly to mainstream and normalize dreaded terrorists like Hafiz Saeed and Mazood Azhar who have waged a war against non-Islamic sphere of the globe, precisely India and the United States of America. Radicalization and uh, terrorism is growing uh, in South Asia from the past so many years. As you, If you look at uh, what is happening, for example, in Pakistan, there is a there is a movement going on to uh, mainstream uh, Hafiz Sayyid, who is actually uh, has a has a 10 million bounty on him. He's a leader of the Lashkar-e Toiba, the Jamaat e Dawa, and is actually exporting terrorism into Jammu and Kashmir. The Islamic extremism that has now been in public for for a significant period of time in South Asia, courtesy Taliban, Lashkar-e Taiba, Al Qaeda, and several of their splinter groups, by and large, have the same roots of origin, and that is Pakistan. Acknowledging the steps taken by the USA in containing the terrorism emanating from the geography of Pakistan by abolishing different forms of discrete and indiscreet assistance provided by it, experts present in the event said that the growing nexus between the terrorists and the political establishment of countries such as Pakistan posed one of the gravest threats to the world. Historically, there's unfortunately been a very strong crossover between the Indian subcontinent and the UK in terms of terrorism. And certainly in the 1990s, uh, not enough attention was paid to the fact that so many young Britons were going out to uh, Kashmir, for example, uh, into Pakistan, attending training camps, going on to uh, Afghanistan when the, uh, the Taliban were in control there, and um, getting involved in, in political, politico-religious currents that have proven to be very problematic indeed. We also had people making the opposite journey, which was coming from uh, South Asia to the UK, people like Masood Azhar, um, some quite problematic uh, clerical speakers who were able to organise in the UK in the 1990s, again, in a way that uh, the authorities rather missed. Experts believe that Pakistan, which has lost to India at all fronts in conventional warfare, has used terrorism as a proxy tool to destabilise the region of Kashmir. A huge amount of currency is flushed to lure the vulnerable youth of Kashmir in the name of religion to join the terror factory run by Islamabad. Indoctrination is very impactful. You know, um, it is not only in the beginning, it was about maybe political grievances, autonomy, whatever. Then it turned into an Islamic uh, jihad in Kashmir when we killed the Kashmiri Pandits, when we said that Islamic rule will, uh, will be followed here. Now it has turned into pan-Islamism. You know, Zarqawi is an engineer. Osama bin Laden was quite educated. Uh, many uh, uh, people in Britain who are going to South Asia or even Syria to fight with ISIS, they are educated because they are made to believe that this is a pan-Islamic thought which will, Islam will rule the whole world. Young boys in Kashmir are being coerced and brainwashed into believing that everyone in the world, everyone in the Muslim world is fighting for Kashmir, is dying for Kashmir and is willing to establish an Islamic caliphate in Kashmir, which is not true. Hafiz Sayyid, a UN-designated terrorist, the mastermind of Mumbai terror attacks in 2008, killing 166, who also carries a bounty of 10 million US dollars, has been spewing venom and brainwashing the youths in the name of religion, has now joined mainstream politics in Pakistan. 
Pakistan is getting increasingly isolated at the international platform owing to its constant support to terrorism and that is the reason it has found itself in the grey list of the Financial Action Task Force. Having been denied of the annual financial assistance by the US and left alone by even closest of its allies in recent past, Pakistan today stands on the cusp of being declared a terror state. Pakistan was also exposed to the UN Human Rights Council for providing shelter, logistics, weaponry and launching pads to the terrorists in order to create mayhem across its borders. My colleague Ravi Khandelwal spoke to Yona Barakova, a research analyst from European Foundation for South Asian Studies on the rising Islamic terrorism in South Asia. Have a look. Yona, the world is suffering today uh, with the rise of extremism and terrorism. So when we talk about South Asia, so what are the prominent issues that the people of uh, South Asia are suffering these days? Terrorism overall is a very complex and multifaceted phenomena and its uh, global challenge has increased in recent years, especially after the tragic incidents of 9-11. Often the roots of origin of uh, terrorism originate in uh, developing economies such as Afghanistan and Pakistan, where uh, disenfranchised and uh, radical segments are using violence in order to counter their so-called perceived enemies, uh, which is usually the perception of Western supremacy. There are many terrorist outfits, those who are based in Pakistan itself. Uh, when we talk about Haqqani Network or lashkar e taiba people like Hafiz Sayyid are still operating from Pakistani soil. So do you believe that it's time to, for the world to act against Pakistan? Pakistan has a history of uh, state-sponsored terrorism and therefore it's high time for the international community to stop turning a blind eye to that complex issue because it will inevitably have a repercussion on uh, the entire global security um, board. And uh, the reason for that is that the globalization phenomena inherently connects people through social media, through mainstream media, the borders are really easily obscured. One message that, one radicalized message that occurs in South Asia inevitably could reach other parts of the world. That's why the international community should eventually take things into its own hand before it has become a victim of the terrorism that originates in Pakistan. Do you believe that with the uh, with the Pakistan supporting this terror outfits, the common people in Pakistan they are suffering a lot. Their human rights are being violated at large. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, that's the that's the truth. And it's uh, the people are suffering. There is a lack of freedom of expression. Although in the Constitution of Pakistan it's stated as a it's as a right, um, freedom of expression is uh, suppressed. Um, people who are trying to raise their voices, uh, scholars, academicians, lawyers, uh, they are being purposefully. Uh, disappeared, they are being persecuted, they are being uh, subject to torture, to, uh, to capital punishment. Um, so it's a necessity this to be tackled. Moving on to India that is taking giant strides in the production and consumption of alternative sources of energy. India co-hosted the first conference of the International Solar Alliance with France. A report. International Solar Alliance that was formed following the Paris Declaration as an alliance dedicated to the promotion of solar energy among its member countries met for the first time in New Delhi to join hands in its fight against the climate change. The initiative focusing on scheming a finance mechanism for the endorsement of solar energy in the member nations was launched by Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi. The International Solar Alliance comprising of 121 member nations aims to exploit solar energy available to the participant countries thereby reducing the dependence on fossil fuels. Sur trois points, l'identification de projets, l'accès au financement, l'accès aux technologies. Nous y reviendrons plus longuement demain, mais je crois que c'est un moment très important non seulement pour l'Inde, pour notre partenariat, mais pour la cause que nous défendons sur le plan international. Macron said France and India were deeply committed to deliver concrete results to protect the planet. Modi outlined a 10-point action during his address to bring a worldwide solar revolution. As many as 62 member nations committed that they will increase the share of solar power in their energy mix to deal with climate change and provide energy to underprivileged in the society. 
Prime Minister Modi, who deserves the credit for bringing such alliance into existence, emphasized at how India was showing light to others when it comes to using alternate sources of energy. 28 crore LED bulbs के वितरण से पिछले तीन साल में न सिर्फ two billion dollars से अधिक की बचत हुई है, बल्कि four gigawatt बिजली भी बची है। यही नहीं, 30 million ton carbon dioxide भी कम बनी। Friends, हम सिर्फ भारत में ही नहीं, विश्व में भी सोलार क्रांति चाहते हैं। With about 300 clear and sunny days in a year, the calculated solar energy incidence on India's land area is about 5,000 trillion kilowatt hours per year. The solar energy available in a single year exceeds the possible energy output of all the fossil fuel energy reserves in India. The 20 gigawatt capacity was initially targeted for 2022, but the government achieved the target four years ahead of schedule. The country added 3 gigawatt of solar capacity in 2015 to 16 and over 5 gigawatt in 2016 to 17, the highest of any year, with the average current price of solar electricity dropping to 18 percent below the average price of its coal-fired counterpart. The Indian government has set an ambitious target of setting up 175 gigawatt of renewable power capacity by the end of 2022. This includes 100 gigawatt from solar, 60 from wind, 10 from biomass and 5 from small hydro. Moving on to the beleaguered state of Afghanistan where a few days back, President Ashraf Ghani invited the resurging Taliban for peace talks with no preconditions in order to restore stability to region. In the recent turn of events, the European Union and the United States of America have shown a keen interest in bringing Taliban to the table and in fact the EU has urged all countries in contacts with Taliban to reach out to Taliban. A report. The United States of America stepping up assistance to the Afghan military had radically increased the airstrikes to flush out the Taliban terrorists holed up in the hinterlands of the country has shown a dramatic shift in its stance after Afghan President Ashraf Ghani announced that his government was ready to recognize the Taliban as a political group and wanted to talk with it with no preconditions. Jim Mattis, the Defense Secretary to the United States who was on an unannounced visit to Kabul, conveyed his government's message. Ashraf Ghani, who hasn't received any official reply from the Taliban leadership, is hopeful of a turnaround in country's atmosphere that has been ravaged by years of violence. He described the new US strategy as a game-changer, allowing Kabul to extend its peace offer to the Taliban without doing so from a position of weakness. It's been a game-changer because it has forced every actor to re-examine their assumptions. Some of that re-examination are likely to lead to the intensification of conflict in the short term, but the re-examination is what the people of Afghanistan have been waiting for 40 years. Meanwhile, the EU Special Envoy to Afghanistan, Roland Kobia, urged all countries and organizations that are in contact with the Taliban to make all possible efforts to bring them to the table of negotiation for a peace agreement. What is important, I think, is for all countries, not only China, but uh, a number of countries have um, a formal or less formal contact with the Taliban. What is important, I believe, is that all those countries that have contacts with them try to encourage them to show them, uh, number one, that the peace offer that has been proposed to them is the best peace offer that has been made since the Ghani administration. Uh, the President, uh, President Ghani has never made such um, a clear and unconditional offer. He said the Taliban should seize Afghan President Ashraf Ghani's offer and should end the years of war that has only done harm to the people of country and abroad. In these kind of, uh, of scenarios, uh, windows open very quickly, but they can also close very quickly. And I think if all the constituencies in Afghanistan, both the government and the Taliban and you know the different provinces and region, want to look at the national interest of their own people first, well, this is an opportunity to do it. 
China has worked with Pakistan and the United States to broker peace talks to end the Taliban insurgency that last year alone killed or wounded more than 10,000 Afghan civilians. Ghani has also proposed a ceasefire and a release of prisoners among a range of options, including new elections involving the militants and a constitutional review of a pact with the Taliban to end their conflict. Taliban has not given any official reply to the offer till date. Moving on to Bangladesh, where no definitive step has been taken to alleviate the sufferings of Rohingya refugees who have been drilling under precarious weather since 25th August last year, when a military crackdown by Myanmar forced them to flee their homes in Rakhine and cross over to Cox Bazar in Bangladesh. A deal was signed between the two countries to repatriate those who were affected in an organized manner. However, no tangible progress has been made so far in the direction. A report. The sprawling camps of Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh Cox's Bazar continue to receive people fleeing from Myanmar border areas. The deal signed between Bangladesh and Myanmar in November for a safe and secure repatriation of the refugees is yet to see any major development as Myanmar authorities have denied entry to many blaming the Bangladesh government for not providing the correct information required for refugees to resettle in Myanmar. These 374 are verified, so they can come back at their own, own convenience. So out of 8032, we verify uh, 374. So these 374 can be the first batch of repatriation. Myanmar says it was unable to confirm whether the rest of the refugees had previously lived in the country as some documents did not include fingerprints and individual photographs. Meanwhile, Amnesty International condemned Myanmar authorities' treatment of Rohingya Muslims after the campaign group released a report claiming that military bases are being built where Rohingya used to live. So this is for us very clearly a militarization of northern Rakhine state. Um, in many areas, the military are just grabbing land to build their own security force bases. Um, you know, for a Rohingya population still there, this is obviously a situation where they're going to be closer to the security forces, they're going to have more security forces. The report is also suggestive of a meagre possibility of resettlement of Rohingyas as houses are being burned and villages are being bulldozed to the ground and only new security bases are being built. New houses are also being built but not for the people who were rendered homeless in the state-sponsored violence but for the non-Rohingyas Buddhists. Meanwhile, United Nations has urged India and China to use its influence and leadership to bring normalcy in the region. We need today more than ever to take the right decision so as to prevent conflict, to prevent atrocity crimes. And I cannot but simply invite both China and India to use their leverage because it is not about simply the Rohingya, it is about humanity, it is about saving lives. Nearly 700,000 Rohingya fled Myanmar after militant attacks on August 25 sparked a crackdown led by security forces in the western Rakhine state that the United Nations and United States termed ethnic cleansing. A harsh security response to attacks by Rohingya insurgents on August 25 sent members of the mostly stateless minority fleeing to Bangladesh and saw more than 350 villages destroyed by a fire in the western Myanmar's Rakhine state. Myanmar received a flurry of criticism during the 37th session of United Nations Human Rights Council too. Moving on Sri Lanka, where the president has decreed a state of emergency following communal clashes between the Sinhalese Buddhists and minority Muslims. The situation seems to have been returning to normalcy after the military took over the control of most of the violence-hit areas. The government of Sri Lanka has also assured victims of riots for rehabilitation and reconstruction and compensation for the damages they incurred during the clashes. A report. Revelers returned to Sri Lankan tourist spots again as normalcy was restored following the imposition of a state of emergency in the state that gave sweeping powers to the military to contain the violent situation in the country. Experts say tourism, one of the biggest contributors to state's economy, was bound to be affected after violence hit the historically significant city of Kandy. However, the tourism ministry said it did not expect any major impact of the 10-day emergency on the $4 billion tourism industry. 
we went out from the hotel in the night for a little walk. There was nobody again in the street. And uh, the situation uh, looked like being under control. So I think uh, everything was quiet. But again, in the night, we saw a lot of police. And so this, for tourists, this is not the best ideal situation that you can find. The Muslim community, which was at the receiving end of the violence, has rejoined the community prayers being held in the temporary structures until the damaged properties are rebuilt. The Muslims were grateful to the government and the police. Candy is a prime destination for foreign travellers famous for the Buddhist temple of the sacred tooth relic, tea gardens and natural beauty. Most of Sri Lanka's Muslims live in the east and centre of the island and make up about 9% of its 21 million population. Buddhists make about 70% and ethnic Tamils, most of whom are Hindus, about 13%. The immediate trigger for the latest series of violence was the death of M.G. Kumara Singhe, a Buddhist man in Kandy district who succumbed to his injuries after being assaulted by Muslim youth allegedly under the influence of alcohol. Moving on to India, where today we will take you to the Goa's biggest religious Hindu festival, Singbo, the festival that spans over a fortnight with different days assigned for different modes of celebration. So let's get indulged in the vibrant and jolly festivity. Among the various colourful feasts and festivals celebrated across Goa, Shigmo is one of the most eagerly awaited events. Celebrated with colours, costumes, music, dance and parades, the 14-day festival heralds the onset of spring and is organised every year in the month of Hindu calendar Palguna, usually coinciding with March. The, the festival is similar to that of Holi and traditionally it was celebrated to honour the homecoming of the warriors who had left their homes at the end of the Shera festival to fight the invaders. It is a festival celebrated as a Holi festival. Holi is our pride. It's a festival of colours and this is a real culture of Goa. The streets of Goa during Shigmotsav are lit up with colourful decor, lively parades, delicious Goan delicacies and music and dance performances. The parades give one and all a chance to take a glimpse at the life of a Goan, which is depicted in elaborate folk performances by local men and women who dance tirelessly in huge processions along with the parade. It seems like a really fun event and uh, a lot of colors, pretty beautiful and looks pretty exciting so I'm uh, excited to join you guys in the celebration. One of the star attractions of this festival is paper mache and paper filled devils and other known characters from Indian mythology. The most popular characters are Ravan from the Hindu epic Ramayana and Narka Sur from Mahabharat. Numerous festivals like Sigmo have been attracting tourists from around the world. With that, we have come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Take care and goodbye.